Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Margaret Vestier goes to Washington. It is her job to keep big tech in check. The European Commissioner for Competition joins us for a wide-ranging interview. Plus, Slack sends a message to the competition with a $250 million funding round led by SoftBank. CEO Stuart Butterfield spoke to us in a first on Bloomberg interview about a potential IPO and beeping up ammo in the war for the corporate messaging services market. And the age of streaming makes one of its biggest marks to date on television's biggest night. Why Hulu's and Netflix's big wins at the Emmys is redefining the new titans of TV and throwing Hollywood into flux. But first, to our lead. European regulators are stepping up their pressure on U.S. tech companies. With European Commissioner for Competition Margaret Vestier at the helm, the EU has announced massive fines against Apple and Google. This week, she's in the U.S. visiting her American counterparts as well as top political leaders. So what is on the agenda? I want to get straight now to my colleague David Gura, who is in Washington. David, take it away. Emily, thank you very much. Mr. Vestier, thank you very much for the time this afternoon on what was a very it's busy a day to be for with you. you. Let me start by asking you about the meetings that you had today. Uh, you met with folks at the FTC and the Department of Justice. Just share, if you could, the, the substance of those conversations. What were you talking to those counterparts about today? Well, we don't share the substance mm. uh, because very often we have the opportunity just to take stock of, uh, of open cases. Uh, and since they're open, of course, this is not something that we can share with a wider audience. Given uh, what we've read in the news about vacancies at these departments, uh, the fact that you have people on an interim basis filling a lot of these roles at the FTC, at the Department of Justice, uh, is that merely a frustration or is that proving to be difficult as you work with counterparts across uh, the Atlantic? Is it somehow different not having permanent political appointees in place at these organizations? Well, maybe to some degree in the beginning I, I wondered, but, but now I, I got to know both uh, Maureen Olhausen and Andrew Finch uh, rather well. I met a couple of times. And, and there is such a strong culture of very concrete cooperation between the case teams uh, because they share this culture of, of serving uh, the consumer in the market. And, and therefore, you know, uh, it is very concrete, it's very direct, it's a very good cooperation. I wonder if you could just give me some insight into that uh, cooperation. Uh, you're doing your own investigations, working on your own cases, that's happening here in the U.S. Uh, as well. What's uh, the ideal relationship like between your office and the FTC, say, or the Department of Justice? Well, to some degree, actually, we have a, a different uh, legal basis, so it's not at all just the same. But with the, with the necessary waivers from businesses, uh, we can discuss and exchange uh, to test uh, hypotheses about uh, would this be a competition concern, how do you see this. So the case team, uh, they, they call each other, uh, sometimes they come together. Uh, we have had uh, U.S. Uh, uh, people coming over for uh, some of our hearings. Uh, we go here uh, if something concrete is happening. So it's, it's quite intertwined, uh, of course, very respectful of differences, but also very concrete on, on making it right uh, and getting a very high quality in, in the casework. A question to you as an observer of this place. I think you and I last spoke. You were here mm -hmm. uh, after the election, so you've, you've spent some time mm -hmm. in D.C. Uh, does the terrain look different from you? Does the rhetoric about antitrust, for instance, or competition or regulation sound different coming to Washington now seven, eight months into this president's term? Well, it is as if there is a, a renewed interest, uh, more debates. Uh, I saw it already in, in the election campaign. There is, I think, there's more debate about how to, how to make sure that uh, consumers are well served. Uh, how to make sure that you have vibrant competition because competition is a driver not only for uh, low prices and choice but also for for innovation to be able to in the future to produce uh, affordable prices and, and, and choice and uh, and a lot of go a lot is going on here and, and I find that uh, very inspiring a couple of days ago some senators uh, on Capitol Hill proposed a new mechanism for enforcement uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar among them and the point that she was making as I understand it is uh, the rules the policies are out outdated. Uh, we need to refresh them. Taking a sort of broad perspective on that, um, when you look at policy, enforcement policy, broadly speaking, does it need to be updated, do you think? Do you, do you feel that policy hasn't kept step with where things are when it comes to technology, say? 
Well, for obvious reasons, I've been looking at, at the European sure. situation. Uh, and, and of course, we've been asking ourselves the same question because markets are developing very fast, uh, things are changing, uh, tech uh, and digitalization is forming our society. Uh, but I find that our basic rules, they're fine because some of the motives, uh, well, they're the same. Uh, it's greed, uh, it's, it's fear combined with power that can be a very, very strong combination. And we can deal with that. Our challenge is, of course, to keep our tools sharp and also to develop new tools because we have to be as skilled when it comes to going through massive amounts of, uh, of data uh, as anyone else. And that, of course, uh, is, a, is a challenge, but we accept it uh, to develop uh, with the pace of, uh, of the market participants. We've talked about cooperation. How problematic is it if you guys are not on the same page? I think of when you have been uh, with Halliburton, Baker Hughes, for instance, then you look at Qualcomm and NXP and you're uh, in different camps, uh, it seems like. What kind of problems does that pose, if any, when you and the U.S. aren't on the same page? Well, exactly. In, in this example, that's what we're meant to be seen because we're sure. not uh, done yet. But, but uh, it, it happens quite rarely. Uh, when it happens, uh, I think very often there are very concrete uh, reasons that the market situation is not the same, uh, the market participants play different roles. So, uh, so very often I find that you have objective reasons uh, when we uh, divide in, in uh, how we look at a, say, at a case. How do you assess the efficacy of, of what you're doing? Uh, I think we first spoke after you levied the back tax fine on Apple of, of 13 billion euros. Have you started to see changes as a result of that? Do you see companies reconsidering, publicly reconsidering in private with you talking about the way that they pay their taxes or don't pay their taxes? Has it had an effect on the way companies work from a policy perspective? Well, yes, I think that that change is coming. Uh, it is uh, slow because it takes some time and I think it will be uh, faster when, uh, when our courts have, uh, have dealt with the cases. But you also see member states starting themselves to change their legislation in Luxembourg and, and, and Cyprus uh, on the financing companies in Ireland on the legislation allowing for what we call a double Irish which is being outfaced. Uh, and then of course the legislative pays in, in the European Union as such. Uh, has also changed. Uh, there's much more vigor uh, and member states are, are much more ready to say, well, we, we want a level playing field uh, and we want our tax authorities to work together in order to get it right. Because we see so many businesses, they pay their taxes exactly as one would expect. That should not just be for the many, it should be for everyone. There was news today of Northrop Grumman looking to buy Orbital uh, ATK. Uh, you're seeing a lot of consolidation of very big companies reducing the size of the playing field in a number of sectors. That's aerospace or defense. Um, is that inherently a problematic thing? Um, does it raise concerns to see big companies merging, acquiring, and the, the field of players becoming smaller? Well, it, it always depends uh, because uh, sometimes we see that it may be possible for, uh, for a merger to, to enable lower prices uh, to consumers, that efficiencies can be passed on uh, to consumers. So we, we never have sort of a, uh, an opinion beforehand. We go into the analysis with an open mind uh, to make sure that uh, also post-merger uh, that consumers will be very well served. Just give us some insight, if you would, into how you decide which cases to take up, what the process is like that leads to investigation or the opening of a case. Well, mergers, they just knock on our door. Yeah, and you so, have very limited time to yes, respond. Yes, so yeah. those we, we just uh, do head on. Um, in, in the antitrust uh, cases, for instance, a cartel investigation, we would start sort of looking into under the radar to see, is there something here? Uh, then we may uh, do unannounced inspections to see, well, is there evidence uh, to support uh, our hypothesis? And then eventually we would send a statement of objection if we find that we have a strong case. It is, of course, for any company very troublesome to be in the searchlight uh, of an antitrust investigation. So we are very careful to, to make sure that we find that we have a strong case. That doesn't mean that we have uh, anything but a preliminary uh, look at a case when, when we start it. Uh, but, but of course it has to be something serious, otherwise we, uh, we shouldn't do it. There, there's a perception here rightly or wrongly, that you're targeting American companies. I look back at the, the Google fine uh, of, of recent weeks, uh, 2 billion euros. Um, it seems to give grist to those who think that you are going after American companies. I imagine a lot of what you're doing here when you travel to the U.S. is explaining yourself and the process and, and what companies you're, you're looking at. What do you say to somebody who does suggest that, who feels as though you are unfairly seeking out American companies for action? Well, well first of all, I, I take this very seriously. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because bias has, has no, no place, no home in, uh, in European antitrust. Uh, it would be completely legitimizing uh, what we are doing uh, because the point is that you have a, a single market, it's open for business, but it's, it's not open for bending the rules, uh, deciding the prices in the back office. Uh, and, and we also actually do have uh, the statistics on our side. When you look at, at mergers or antitrust enforcement, uh, you do not find uh, any kind of, uh, of US bias. And that, of course, is very, very important uh, because it is not the flag of the company or the ownership of the company. It's the behavior in the markets uh, that we're concerned with. All right, let's come back and talk a bit about Google in particular, if we could. We'll have much more here with Commissioner Vestager coming up on Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Let's get straight back to Washington with Bloomberg's David Gura, who's standing by with European Commissioner for Competition, Margaret Vestire, who is on a trip to the United States. David, take it away. Emily, thank you very much uh, again. Let's get into Google a little bit here. I think a lot of people are eager to, to hear about that issue in, in particular. Google has 10 days, as I understand it, to comply uh, with, the, with the ruling that you issued a few weeks back. What are you hoping to see by then? Have you seen a draft at this point? Do you have any sense of what Google is going to try to do with regard to shopping? Yes, now soon to be 90 days ago, uh, we took the decision uh, that we have found that Google is dominant in the European market of general search and that Google has been misusing this very strong and dominant position uh, to promote itself uh, in, with the Google shopping product and to demote uh, competitors. Uh, on average, you would find competitors on page four mm -hmm. in your search result and viewers can ask themselves, well, how often do I go there? while you were always finding Google Shopping uh, top uh, left corner uh, in, in the best placement. And the decision says that uh, you have to apply a principle of equal treatment between Google Shopping and uh, competitors because you're dominant. Uh, and now it's up to Google to figure out, well, how to do this, uh, because this is the only way to make a, a, uh, a remedy uh, future-proof, uh, because this page design will change, screen sizes will change, everything will change. Uh, but we still need this to be adhered to. So, of course, we, it remains to be seen how Google will live up to this. Uh, Bloomberg is reporting today that uh, Google is proposing sort of an auction system. They would sell space to rival mm -hmm. uh, companies, and that's something they proposed in, in 2013 uh, it, with another issue. Can you confirm that that's the case? Have they floated that as an idea? Yes, we got, uh, we got a first draft of what they were thinking, uh, I think about uh, two weeks ago. So we got a broad outline about what they're thinking. But the thing is that it's not for us to approve. It is for Google to find a way to live up to the decision. Uh, and this is, of course, very important, uh, because if Google uh, does not live up to the decision, then we will start investigating, uh, well, what is the situation and is competition still harmed so that consumers have lesser choice that they would otherwise have. So if, if come the 29th of September or however many days uh, mm -hmm. after you're not satisfied, uh, when does fining start? When do you begin to calculate and assess fines against Google if they haven't met the, the burden that you'd like them to meet? Well, actually, we can sort of backdate uh, the fine so that it will start from the first day that we find that there's been an, a non-compliance uh, with the decision. Um, so obviously, if, if we find, for instance, mark uh, market uh, well, competi competitors uh, complain, mm -hmm. the consumers may complain to say, well, this is, this is not what it was supposed to be. Uh, if we find reason, uh, we will start investigating and then we can predate uh, the fines uh, if we find that there is a breach of, uh, of following up on the decision. Can you give us any sense of the timetable here with these two other Google cases? There's the AdSense case and the Android case mm -hmm. uh, as well. How close are you to resolution of those two? Well, they are, they are very different, uh, the two cases, uh, because the AdSense case concerns uh, placement of ads on, on third-party uh, sites and, and whether or not that market was foreclosed. Uh, the Android case is how Android is used uh, to stay dominant also when we all go mobile, so that the sort of the experience from the box when you open the box of, of your new phone is a Google experience. 
uh, we treat both cases as, as high priority cases, but it's very difficult to say when we will be, be uh, able to take a final decision. So you say which is farther along than the other, or are they both kind of proceeding uh, in tandem? Well, as I said, they're different, so mm. we have, uh, have two case teams, and uh, I don't know if they're competing as, as well, but, uh, but we really put a lot of effort into this because it is important for uh, all market participants to know what will be the final decision. A couple of months ago, I was speaking with Dara Khosrowshahi, who was then the head of Expedia. Mm -hmm. uh, he's now, of course, uh, at Uber, and, and he was expressing concern about Google with regard to travel services. When you look at the mammoth apparatus that is Google, are there other parts of the business that uh, concern you or that might lead to, to investigations? Well, we have quite a lot of, uh, of complaints on, on other uh, verticals. And the thing is that with the Google shopping decision, uh, having established that Google is dominant in, in general search, and when a company is dominant, well, obviously, uh, competition is already weakened a little. Uh, if you hold 90% of, of the market. And this is where this special responsibility comes from, that you shouldn't misuse your powers in your own market or neighboring markets. So uh, this gives us a, another starting point looking at uh, travel or, or locals. Uh, so in, in that respect, yes, uh, we still take a, a strong interest in Google behavior in, in these other markets. I asked you if the Apple tax case had caused other companies to adjust. In the context of Google, you've levied this two billion euro fine. Have you seen that company begin to change its ways, to work with your office to forestall further fining of, of that company in particular? Is there a dialogue between the, you and the company, I guess is what I'm asking? Oh, yes, there is a dialogue, and, and I find them to be very, very uh, professional. Uh, we, we don't agree <laughs> on, on these, uh, these issues, but I think it is important, uh, no matter your disagreement, uh, and here we're talking about a decision by the Commission and a fine of, as you say, 2.4 uh, billion euros, mm -hmm. but it is still important to have a professional relationship because we want a change in market behavior. Uh, to enable competition so that the market serves the consumer. And, uh, and on that, hopefully, we can find a way. Christian Vestier, thank you very much. Very it generous with your pleasure. time. Appreciate thank that. Christian Margaret Vestier joining me here at the EU Delegations Headquarters in Washington. Back to you, Emily, in San Francisco. All right, David, thank you so much. Coming up this Thursday, we've got Vera Jarova, European Commission Commissioner for Justice, Consumers and Gender Equality, will be joining Bloomberg Technology this Thursday, as I said, to discuss the latest on the EU U.S. Privacy Shield. Well, former Cisco CEO John Chambers is stepping down from the board after 24 years. Chuck Robbins, who's been CEO since 2015, will take on the role of executive chairman. The change gives Robbins more complete control to steer Cisco away from its reliance on high-priced hardware, which provides most of its revenue. Coming up, the competition for workplace messaging apps heating up, and Slack is looking to solidify its standing with a boost from SoftBank. That is next. This is Bloomberg. The workplace messaging service Slack has secured $250 million in its latest round of funding. More than half of that amount came from SoftBank's Vision Fund, putting the value of Slack at $5.1 billion. Earlier this month, Slack, which has more than 6 million daily users, announced its service will expand to Germany. In, in German, French, Spanish, and Japanese. Today, Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield spoke with Bloomberg Surveillance about the company's valuation and potential for an IPO. We're still relatively early, although uh, we've grown fairly large. Uh, we're still growing as quickly as we can. And so we just had our first user conference in San Francisco last week. We announced a number of big partnerships. But significantly, we announced the launch of Slack in German, French, and Spanish. So that's why I'm here in London kicking off the European tour. Um, and with projects like that, we have very little ability to predict how fast we'll be growing. And I think predictability is one thing we'll be missing as a public market company. Stuart, I love that you have a European tour. I expect t-shirts to be put out with the concert venues. You're from Vancouver, so maybe it will be like Hart from long ago and far away. Mm -hmm. Here's the issue. Guys in dark suits and bow ties look at an extrapolation of VC fundraise to $5 billion plus and go, what kind of dumb accounting is this? How do you as a CEO <laughs> respond when the fancy guys in suits and ties tell you you're worth $5 billion? I don't buy it for a minute. 
Oh, I love the question. So we're a little under four years in market. Um, we crossed $200 million in annual recurring revenue earlier. We're still growing at 100% a year. 50,000 plus customers around the world, 43% of the Fortune 100. Um, and up to this point, we have been English language only. Um, so I expect strong growth in Europe and also in Asia. I mean, within this is the ability to raise revenue. And you've got within your notes and your PR on your European tour that odd thing that you're actually building revenue. What's the quality of that revenue stream? Is it Amazon quality? Is it eBay quality? Or is it a pie in the sky? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to, to take the comparison there, uh, but one of the great things about SaaS businesses generally, and Slack in particular, is that that revenue is recurring. Uh, over the three and a half years, we've had about 15% cumulative churn, so it's about 20 basis points of churn a month. So I'm not going to say that it's best in the industry, but it's got to be pretty close if it's mm -hmm. not the best, um, and we are building on that in a pretty rapid pace. Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield there speaking with Bloomberg Surveillance's Tom King earlier today. Well, streaming platform Roku is aiming to raise as much as $219 million in its initial public offering. The company and selling shareholders are marketing 15.7 million shares for $12 to $14 a piece. Nine million of those shares will be sold by Roku. That's according to a filing with the SEC. Roku has yet to turn a profit since its inception in 2002 and faces increased competition from Apple, Google and Amazon in the crowded market of home streaming devices. Coming up, how has the mega breach at Equifax impacted the demand for cyber insurance? We will talk to none other than Lloyds of London CEO Inga Beale. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. President Trump says he and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu are, quote, giving it an absolute go in the Middle East peace process. Both leaders are here in New York for this week's UN General Assembly meeting. Prime Minister Netanyahu said Israel's alliance with the U.S. has been, quote, never stronger than now under the Trump administration. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and British Prime Minister Theresa May say their countries are working toward a new bilateral trade deal that would be in effect after the UK leaves the European Union. The template for a deal would be CETA, the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement, which comes largely into effect this week between Canada and the EU. This agreement will create jobs and stimulate growth for people in Canada and across Europe. Prime Minister May and I discussed the UK's ratification of CETA, as well as the importance of stability and continuity in the Canada-UK trading partnership into the future. Prime Minister May has criticized her Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, for his unauthorized intervention in the Brexit debate. Johnson wrote a newspaper article that led to the accusation he was trying to undermine the Prime Minister's approach to Brexit. Russia held military drills about 60 miles east of Estonia's border today. The maneuvers have raised concerns about a lack of transparency and Moscow's true intentions. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. here in New York, 7.30 in the morning in Sydney. I'm joined by my colleague Paul Allen with a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Well, uh, that positive lead we have from U.S. markets is expected to push things a little higher around the Asia-Pacific as well. We've got Nikkei futures traded out of Chicago, up better than a tenth of 1% right now. The Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has admitted uh, that he is considering calling an election possibly up to a year early, and there'll be a decision on that once he returns from the United States. Here in Australia, we've got ASX futures also up better than 1%, I mean a, point, a tenth of 1%, I beg your pardon. Uh, we're waiting on earnings, uh, full year earnings from TPG Telecom and also 10 network creditors, the embankment.
embattled broadcaster will meet today on an offer from the U.S. Uh, broadcaster CBS. Keep an eye also on the Aussie dollar that may move on the release of the Reserve Bank of Australia minutes from the September meeting. The cash rate was, of course, kept on hold at a record 1.5%, so we're looking uh, for any commentary there. That's uh, all from uh, me here in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. The DOJ has opened a criminal investigation into whether top executives at Equifax violated insider trading laws. It looks into whether CFO John Gamble and presidents of the Information Solutions and Workforce Solutions units were aware of the massive data breach before they sold their shares. Equifax announced this month that it discovered the breach July 29th. The three sold shares worth almost $1.8 million in early August. And in addition, according to Bloomberg sources, Equifax's insurance against cyber breaches is far from enough than what's needed to cover the credit reporting company's costs tied to one of the biggest hacks in history. Joining us now for an exclusive conversation about cybersecurity insurance is Inga Beal, Lloyds of London CEO. Inga, great to have you here it's in San Francisco. So very high risk insurance. I know that's what you do. But talk to us about the landscape for cyber insurance. How many businesses actually have this right now and, and how does it work? Yeah, so cyber insurance varies quite a lot. We can offer all sorts of different types of insurance. It's been written for about 20 years, believe it or not. Um, so people might think it's a very, very new form. But what's happened really is that in the US in particular, the government introduced regulations around breach reporting and that put it on the boardroom agenda in the US. Mm. So the total cyber insurance market is worth about two and a half billion dollars but about 80% of that is actually coming from US businesses. Mm. So in terms of proportions of num uh, you know, businesses that buy it, it's basically in the US. It's still a very small, fairly small number of businesses though that offer this. And I'm curious, from your perspective, it seems like there's a lot of risk involved. It's inevitable almost that companies will get hacked. So, you know, why bother? Yeah, well, there are, there is, I mean, no business is immune from being hacked and however, complacent people might be, um, they really should be very, very aware of the threat. We've done some research and it actually showed that about 92% of businesses think that they're going to be hacked, but very few of them buy insurance against it. And I think a lot of people have a lot of trust in their own risk mitigation, so they think they've got in place the right firewalls and things, but a lot of breaches actually happen because of human error. So we've got all the technology in place, but a lot of the time it's actually some human mistake, genuinely, you know, not meant, not malicious, but some employee mistake. So no business, no, almost no individual, no business can think of themselves as immune. Now what's happened, what's happening around the world to actually boost demand for cyber insurance is that regulation is coming in in many other parts of the world. So in the um, EU, uh, next year there'll be new data regulation, meaning that businesses can be fined a hell of a lot of money if they're um, found not to be looking after their customers properly, not to be looking after their customer data properly, not informing their customers of breaches. Go to another part of the world, you go to Australia, they introduce regulation. We saw a 2,000% uptick in cyber insurance demand. Have you seen an uptick in demand since Equifax? I think it's a bit too early, but any headline news about cyber attacks gets people thinking differently about it and they go, wow, I'm not sure I can be immune here. So as we've reported, Equifax's insurance plan likely covers somewhere between 100, 150 million dollars. We're talking about damages though in the tens of billions of dollars. What's the point if your insurance can't cover the vast majority of it? Well, I think we're all learning. Mm -hmm. So it is um, in the whole scale of insurance, which has been going for hundreds of years, uh, 20 years is not a big, big um, space of time to have been selling this product for even buying this product. So we're all learning here. Now, there were an enormous number of customers affected with Equifax. Uh, we are always trying to learn from events, learning how to assess all the damages. Um, and people do choose um, a limit of their insurance policy that seems to make sense at the time. But every time we learn something, um, we have to reassess the pricing, reassess the scale of damages. So talk to me about how you build your policies because, you know, every company can be hacked. 
hacks can be delayed, it could take months, years before you realize something that has happened. How does that impact how your building the policies that you're selling. Yeah, well Lloyd's is very unique in terms of it's being a market, not a single unitary carrier. And so we've got uh, nearly, oh, well over 80 businesses actually writing insurance in our market. And it's through that sort of collaborative nature of sharing risk, it's a syndicated market. Uh, we have a lot of experts who get together. We work actually with modeling firms. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with science, for instance, um, based out here in the US, who are really trying to understand how we can model the interconnectivity of businesses across the world. Because while some of the hacks affect only one firm, we've seen other attacks, like um, WannaCry and things, mm -hmm. which actually affect numerous firms. And for us, it's not necessarily uh, working out what an individual limit should be for a company, for an insurer that's taking on these risks, it's how do we aggregate it across the world when this risk knows no geographic boundaries. In the Equifax situation in particular, there's concern that maybe some executives may have known about it before the public was alerted, before the government was alerted. How does that impact the policies? Yeah, well, people, we do expect a certain um, professional behavior when we issue insurance policy, and, the, and there will be caveats around what is expected behavior. There might even be such restrictions, and I'm not talking about any individual firm now, I'm talking in general, individual restrictions on what mitigation they must take themselves in terms of employee training, in terms of firewalls, in terms of patching old software and things like that. So there, as usual with insurance, we, we do like to stipulate um, certain requirements. So it's a fairly small part of the market now, but do you see over time this becoming as standard as general liability insurance, or do you think it'll always be a sort of niche part of the market? I think it'll become fairly standard because mm. when we think of what technology is doing to all businesses, it's going to be one of the biggest risks that businesses face. We look at the, um, the companies that make up the S&P 500 and we look 40 years ago. 84% of the assets in the S&P 500 were tangible. They were physical assets that we could, we understood physical buildings. Now it's completely reversed. 84% of those assets are intangible. It's technology, it's systems, it's data. And that trend is just going to continue. And we've all got to get our heads around the changing nature of risk, and particularly as an insurance sector, make sure we're innovating fast enough to keep up with how businesses are changing. All right, Inga Beale, CEO of Lloyd's of London. Fascinating part of your business. Thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you. All right, well, there is a lot of debate centered around Bitcoin, but one thing for certain is that it's full of volatility. The cryptocurrency rebounded from last week's slide and topped the $4,000 level yet again. Investor concern is easing that a crackdown by Chinese regulators will hinder growth. There's a belief that traders in China are likely to switch to alternative exchanges or seek loopholes in regulation. China banned initial coin offerings and plans to ban trading of Bitcoin and other virtual currencies on domestic exchanges. Coming up, who's historic night at the Emmys? What the streaming service did last night that neither Netflix or Amazon have been able to achieve. This is Bloomberg. Well, the most iconic magazine in the music industry is up for sale. Rolling Stone co-founder Jan Wenner is putting up his majority stake for sale. The magazine, known for cutting-edge music, political and cultural reporting, is the latest publication struggling with years of losing advertising and readership to nimbler online alternatives. Wenner sold a 49% stake in Rolling Stone to Singapore-based Band Lab Technologies in September 2016. Well, it was a historic night at the Emmys as Hulu became the first streaming service to take home a win for outstanding drama. The Handmaid's Tale took home the big prize last night, something that neither Netflix or Amazon have yet to do at the Emmys. Netflix, though, still took home 20 statues last night, a strong showing, and Hulu won 10 Emmys in all, including Elizabeth Moss's win for Outstanding Actress in a Drama Series, The Handmaid's Tale. Back in July, I asked Hulu CEO Mike Hopton, Hopkins about the show, and he sounded like he was looking into a crystal ball. Take a listen. 
You know, we started original programming at Hulu five years ago, um, and our most recent uh, batch started about a year and a half ago, and we've been in business with some of the best out there, J.J. Abrams, Jason Kadams, Amy Poehler, and, uh, but this one is really special. It really has broken through in a way that, no that, that nothing ever has for us, and so we're really excited about it. Joining now from L.A. to discuss uh, streaming's big night, Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw. Lucas, I'm so curious what the buzz right now is in Hollywood, what this means uh, for Hulu going forward. Surprise, really. I mean, if you had asked someone, anyone, a couple of years ago, which would be the first tech company, first streaming service to win a big award at the Emmys, they would have probably said Netflix, maybe Amazon. They've made a lot more shows, gotten a lot more attention. With Hulu, with, with Handmaid's Tale, this is really their first breakout. And I spoke with most of the Hulu executives at their party last night, and they thought that Elizabeth Moss was going to win for Best Actress. And some of them certainly hoped they would win Best Drama. Nobody saw them taking five different categories and really sweeping the, the drama. Field. Does the prestige here translate into viewership? That's a great question. I think it matters. It really matters in the industry. It's going to be a good lure for talent, for producers to say, hey, we can compete with the HBOs, Netflixes of the world, FX. You know, in terms of viewership, I'm sure they get a little bit of a marketing advantage. You know, Hulu just hired a new head of marketing from Google, and her job just got a whole lot easier. She can put on every single campaign, you know, Emmy-winning show. How much the Emmy means to the average viewer is less clear to me, because it doesn't, it's not a show that has, has mattered in culture as much as, say, the Oscars or the Grammys. Last night, just about 11, 12 million people watched, not as big an audience as for those award shows. Does it give Netflix and Amazon concern? Certainly a little bit. I mean, they have, you know, Netflix has been the leader in streaming TV, and they, for even though they will kind of downplay how much they care about winning awards, they spend a fortune trying to win those things because they know that there's some, it can help them in some inexplicable, excuse me, ineffable way. Um, and so I, I'm sure that they don't like that Hulu was, was there to beat them, that these big media companies that bash them in the press can say, hey, our streaming service won first. But in the grand scheme of things, as we kind of said in the intro to this, Netflix still won 20 awards. They won four last night. They had the second most nominations of any network. And so I think they probably also feel like it's a matter of time before they have that show that really breaks through. So Talk to us about how you expect the online content race to now shape up between Hulu and Amazon and Netflix and Apple. You know, this, this certainly makes it clear that it can be anyone's game. Yeah, look, all it takes is one hit. That's what anybody in the entertainment business will tell you. Uh, the question is how many chances you, ha you get at it. So Netflix is spending so much money and making so many shows that they have more chances to get that one hit than a lot of these other people. That being said, you know, FX, HBO, they've been a little more disciplined in how much they spend, and they would argue that they only make the highest, highest quality uh, as compared to kind of some of the garbage that Netflix throws out there. The question is, can an Apple or any of these other tech companies who are now entering the space, can they find that project? You know, Netflix early on had to take a lot of kind of the B or C scripts out there because people weren't sure you know, uh, what they were or what an original project on Netflix would look like. Now that Apple's coming around, there's so much competition. Are they going to be able to get their hands on the great material? Uh, okay. and, and that we don't know. All right, Lucas Shaw for us there in Hollywood. It's going to be an exciting race. Thanks so much, Lucas, for stopping by. Coming up, how one company is using U.S.-based teachers to teach English to children in China. We'll dig into the latest ed tech trend. This is Bloomberg.
VIP Kid is an online education company matching Chinese students with teachers in North America. It has been valued at more than one and a half billion dollars after a funding round from investors including Tencent and Sequoia Capital China. I spoke with VIP Kid CEO Cindy Mi and asked about the company's rapid growth since it was founded four years ago. We have uh, over uh, 200,000 students and also over 20,000 teachers given a very short amount of time. And also um, we'll be uh, having a, a revenue of 750 million U.S. for 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, on a day of uh, August 31st, uh, we saw a revenue of 9.95 million U.S. per so day. So where are the students, where are the teachers? The students are uh, mostly in China, and uh, but we do have 2% of students coming from out of China learning with our English immersive program VIP Kid, but then we launched a uh, lingo bus uh, a couple weeks ago teaching uh, uh, kids around the globe to learn Mandarin and then our first student come from Japan now we have over a few hundred students are learning on our platform. So now you have uh, teachers in China teaching Mandarin to students around the world. Yes, we're, and we're connecting the world. So uh, talk to me about why online education seems to have taken off in China more than it has here in the U.S. and, and in other places around the world. Why well, do you think that is? I would say the growth factor contributes to a few reasons. One, uh, the demographic reasons. Uh, the parents are big in learning English and uh, having children know about the world. So uh, it is a, a 15 billion U.S. dollar market mm -hmm. by size and it's growing by 20 percent per year contributing by our 18 million newborn babies every year, right? So and secondly, um, since uh, the market demand is huge, the supply is limited. We only have over 27,000 uh, North American teachers in China. Mm -hmm. So on VIP kid alone, we probably have more teachers than we do in the country. So parents love high quality teaching. They are willing to invest in this sector. So we're seeing at around 10% penetration of online learning to the existing brick and mortar learning market, and it's growing really fast. Some of the skeptics say that online education is still gonna remain an overall small part of the, the, the total industry. Do you agree with that? Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that because it, for the past two years, uh, the last year we talked, it's 2% online penetration for uh, China K-12 online English learning for kids. But this year, it will be close to 10%. And 10% is number of what uh, e-commerce takes over uh, uh, retail market, uh, given the 20 trillion US dollar market. So education, since its nature, is all delivered online, so knowledge sharing. So um, the uh, penetration will be possibly way higher than what it happens to retail. So how much higher than 10% do you think it could be? No, 30, 40% mm -hmm. anywhere because this can be really uh, ubiquitous because um, of the nature of the service. You're just connecting all these disfranchised, dislocated uh, learners and teachers across the globe and this is beautiful. And do you think it's something that will work best with foreign languages or do you see this working across all disciplines? I think this will work across all disciplines. We're already seeing a, a lot of adults learning online on uh, uh, platforms like Coursera, mm -hmm. Udacity, Udemy, and now with the possibility of building a K-12 knowledge graph across the globe for all the students, then you see all the kids using uh, all these tools starting from their where they're little and then they're learning with VIP Kid not only for English language learning but also content-based learning, curriculum-based math, science, and everything. Everything else. Now talk to me a little bit about your strategy because you've sort of set yourselves apart by recruiting American teachers and positioning your services as similar to the education that you would get in top US schools. Explain. Yeah, um, uh, this is unique for uh, the, 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 the children in China because we only focus on highest quality content and also highest, the best like loving and caring teachers that can possibly work with them. Mm -hmm. So this strategy is um, like parents love it because uh, it provides the, the best quality program for the kids. And also not only that, uh, VIP Kid as a company, our strategy is always to uh, advance learning science. Mm -hmm. So we built a very last year and now we're working with with uh, Stanford professor Bruce McCandless and also um, uh, Daphne Collar, who found the, the co founded. What do you mean, uh, do you mean uh, by Coursera. learning science? What does learning science mean? Oh, it means um, of all the data that we're creating on our platform every day, we, we're, we're doing almost uh, 2.19 2. million number of classes uh, in August. So we're creating 
after compression, uh, 100 terabyte data mm -hmm. uh, every month, right? So all these video audio conferencing data are very unique K-12 student learning data. And then with all that, we're able to discover students learn aha moment. Mm -hmm. um, how can they best learn? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if they're, how their interests can be best stimulated and how do we sky for the content so that they can learn well. So we can make learning more efficacious and more efficient by empowering both learners and teachers by um, all these research in big data and, and uh, AI. Cindy Mee, CEO of VIP Kit there. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. On Tuesday's show, we will be speaking with Zenefit CEO Jay Fulcher. And a reminder, we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV, weekdays 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.